Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special edition of the Salt and Light Hour. I'm Deacon Pedro. Today, we're opening up our Salt and Light cabinet and pulling out some of our favorite conversations from the fall of 2023. First off, we're joined by Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, who gives us the appropriate Catholic response to racism. After that, we learn about the ministry team, Damascus Worship, and listen to their amazing music. In our second half hour, we learn all about starting your own Catholic book publishing company. Maria J. Bain of JMJ Press tells us how she did it. And at the end of the program, we reconnect with singer-songwriter P.J. Anderson, who has some new music. We begin now with a Catholic response to racism. It's often that we hear the word racism being thrown around. Some of us have been called racist. I think we all instinctively know that racism and Christianity are not compatible. We may even agree that racism is sin, but most of us do not think of ourselves as racist. Still, most of us are not actively doing anything against racism. Deacon Harold Burke Sivers argues in his latest book, building a civilization of love, that we need a Catholic response to racism. To learn more, I am now joined by Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Deacon Harold, welcome back to the Salt and Light Hour. It's good to see you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So there's so much that I want to cover with you. So I'm going to just like jump right in. What would you say is the difference between racism, prejudice, and bias? Okay. Um, so, and I'm, I'm glad you're asking that because part of uh, what we're not doing in this discussion are making distinctions. Um, and it's important to make distinctions because if we don't, everything gets conflated and everything's racism. Every comment's racism. Every right. book is racism. So, so that's what I do in the book. I make distinctions. So prejudice is making a preconceived notion about someone not based on any subjective or objective knowledge or experience. Okay. All right? And uh, racism is prejudice with the added dimension. The reason why I say this, or the reason why I believe this is because I believe that my race is superior to your race. Right. So that's racism. Okay. And bias is um, you, where you favor one particular group over another. Okay. I see. So, so let, me, let me make a thing. So for example, um, a few years ago at a parish mission, someone came up to me, they found out I went to Notre Dame and said, Oh, you went to Notre Dame. What position did you play? Mm-hmm. Now, <laughs> some people would hear a statement like that and say, that's racist. That's racist. Yeah, no, yeah. It was pre- prejudice, but not racist. Well, right. why? Because he, he looked at me, he goes like, Hey, a, 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 a large, uh, you know, man, plus, you know, plus Notre Dame equals football. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. the fact is I never played football in my life. If you put pads on the floor, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> um, I went on an academic scholarship. So when he found that out, he was embarrassed. Oh, oh, Deacon, sorry. You know, so, so it was prejudice. He, he based it just on right. a presupposition without any knowledge or experience. Um, yeah. If it would have been racist, he would have to have meant when he said it, the reason why I just said that is I believe that people that look like you aren't intelligent enough to get into a school of that caliber academically. And the only way someone like you could get to a school like that is, is with athletics. Yeah, I that get it. That would have been yeah, racist. I understand. I but understand. That's, not what he, that's not what he meant when he said no, it. No, no. So, so we, unless we make those distinctions, then you know we're, we're, we'll never get anywhere. We'll never move the bar forward in helping to uh, really um, uh, defeat the 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 the, uh, the sin of racism. Would you say that there's a distinction then with having prejudiced or racist thoughts and actually actual racist behavior, especially when we talk about sin? Sure, and, and that's what that's what uh, why a lot of people have some fear. So, for example, where did where did these prejudices and racist attitudes come from? They're not innate. In other words, not we're not born yeah. that way, which is one of the things that critical race so theory says learn, we're yeah. innately racist. Yeah, and that's not true. Why? If you see little kids, and let's by anecdotally, if you see little kids playing on the playground, th- three, four, five years old, 
they're they're just kids playing. And yeah. I said, I'm not gonna play with you because you're Hispanic. I mean, you don't yeah. hear that yeah. from them. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. just kids playing. But what happens over time, they look at social media, they look at movies and television and jokes from their parents and uh, all these different influences, they begin to see, you know, people as stereotype. And they and then without any personal interaction uh with someone of that race, you begin to believe that what you're seeing and what's being portrayed through those, through those different media are actually true. Uh -huh. and you begin to believe this. So you start to internalize those things. So if someone said, you know, I don't whenever I'm around black people, I just I just get scared. Yeah. Well, why? I mean, you're not looking at an individual person. You're looking at it just grouping everybody mm -hmm. together as a race. And where does that come from? Because you see things on television, because of the, all these different factors. Right. You get to put people in, you know, put pigeonhole in, people in, in yeah, a certain in paradigm. Yeah. And, and, and that's a problem. Yeah. You mentioned uh, critical race theory, and I know it's a complicated topic, but here in Canada, it's very, it's like people are talking about it, especially in the schools. Can you give us kind of the highlight and maybe why it's problematic? Yeah. So when I wrote this section of the book, um, I wanted to be fair. I said, look, everyone's saying that critical race theory is bad. It's horrible. Um, some people are saying it's great and all this stuff. I said, you know what? I really am not 100 percent sure what this is. So let me get the books of the people who develop critical race theory and read from myself what they actually say it is. So I got the books by Richard Delgado, Janine Stefanik, Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. These are the people that developed critical race theory. And I read their books. And the more I read, the more I began to feel, you know, this is not really going to help us in this discussion of race. Why? For example, in their defini definition of race, um, race is an, an intellectual kind of hypothesis, mm. right, in their, in their way of thinking. So in their understanding of race, race is not about, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, this, this person is... Um, uh, Hispanic, this person's uh, 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 African, this person's, uh, you know, Asian. Asian. It, it's not about that. It's a social construct yeah. where the predominant racial group exercises dominion, authority, and control over mm -hmm. the other groups. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for them, it's a social construct. It's not, you know, not about biology. It's, yeah, it's not, not about a physical culture. Trait. Yeah. It's about, it's like, like, ah, oh, that doesn't sit right. And when, you, and when you look at the evolution of how critical race theory came to be, that came from critical legal theory, which came from critical theory, which came from uh, Marxist material, Marxism. Um, uh, the, uh, Marxist material determinism, which comes from the Hegelian dialectic. It's fascinating, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that, that sounds complicated, but when you trace it, basically uh, what Marx and, and, uh, Eng, uh, Marx and Freud did, they took uh, the Hegelian dialectic, which says you have a thesis and antithesis, and the tension, conflict, and struggle between thesis and antithesis leads to a new synthesis. Yeah. So they did that with the with soft sciences like psychology and sociology and and, and those things. And then Marx and Engels develop um, uh, communism from that socialism. So you yeah. have the uh, you have the uh, proletariat. So you have the bourgeois and a tension, conflict, and struggle between those two lead to a new synthesis, mm -hmm. which is socialist communism. Yeah. And so that same hermeneutic or that same interpretive understanding is the problem with critical race theory. The way they see change happening through the social construct is tension, conflict, and struggle as a way to, uh, uh, as a way to uh, make change, affect change. Right. That's not the gospel. That's not, that's not the Catholic faith at all. No. And, and that's the one thing that I should have pointed out. Um, and I appreciate this, that your book is very much rooted in, in Catholic doctrine and the gospel um, I think that you would agree that we should do everything we can to end racism. Absolutely. Why Why do we need a Catholic response to racism? Is that the only way to end racism? Well, here, here's the thing. The, the Martin Luther King's response, I thought, was absolutely spot on. Uh, you think about it. At that time, in the midst of Jim Crow, in the midst of, of, of like basically legal racism mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the stru governmental structure of the country, how was Martin Luther King? a preacher able to break down uh, barriers between black and white and liberal conservative and, and, and uh, Democrats and Republicans and all these groups to bring people together under this one cause. What was his foundation? The gospel, mm -hmm. right? So when he was killed, there was this, this uh, void, this emptiness, this chasm 
And we see a lot of individuals and organizations today trying to fill that chasm and that void with, on the outside, it says racism, but uh, really is a Trojan horse. Mm. On the inside is a whole other agenda, which has nothing to do with race, but they're using this as an opportunity to push another agenda forward. So the mm. Catholic response is to avoid all of that, uh, avoid a government response, avoid a societal response, and go back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that begins by seeing each other the way God sees them, seeing each the image and likeness of God in every single person, especially the person standing in front of us. Mm -hmm. And that's why we get to your title, Building a Civilization of Love, which makes perfect sense. Deacon Harold, thank you so much for, uh, well, for all the work that you do. I know you're a busy guy. Thank you for, I don't know how, where you found time to write the book. <laughs> Sounds like you had to do a ton of research. Um, but thank you for sharing a little bit of that with us. And I hope that our listeners are going to be intrigued enough to go and get it. Well, thank you for having me. It's been great to be with you today. God bless. Deacon Harold Berg Sivers is an author and speaker. His latest book, Building a Civilization of Love, A Catholic Response to Racism, is published by Ignatius. Here now is Damascus Worship with Hail, O Queen, from their Hail, O Queen project. Hail, O favored one, mother of the sun. To you, God has come, the Lord is with you. You are full of grace, you are heaven's gate. Throughout every age, we honor you. That was Damascus Worship with Hail, O Queen. Damascus Worship is a family of worshipers and a Catholic missionary worship movement. Based in Ohio, the ministry is a product of the Damascus Catholic Mission Campus, modeled after Christian contemporary praise and worship ministries like Hillsong. Damascus Worship offers retreats, worship events, and conferences. And since its beginning, the worship group has released several songs and two albums, Awake My Soul, and God of Promises. And to tell us more, I'm now joined by two of their worship leaders, Seth Schleter and Abby Randolph. Welcome to the Salt and Light Hour, you guys. It's good to meet Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thanks it's for having us. Awesome to be here. So just to just kind of get it out of the way, um, Abby, what is Damascus Catholic Mission Campus? That is a that is a very beautiful big question. Um, we are a missionary movement that really seeks to awaken, empower, equip a generation to live the adventure of their faith, and we do that primarily through summer camps, through retreats, really um, giving the youth of our church and also the adults and young adults um, an opportunity to really encounter Jesus in the Eucharist as a real person. Um, is a really awesome movement that started with Catholic Youth Summer Camp back in 2001 and has grown into an amazing missionary movement that does an incredible youth ministry over the last uh, handful of years. It does look amazing. I mean, if I'm uh, looking at the website, 
I mean, there's like like about like a hundred kajillion employees, that, or I guess are they <laughs> yeah. all like volunteer or missionaries? Like, are you guys all like product of the summer camps? A lot of us are. A lot of us aren't. Some of us are. We uh, we have about seventy something missionaries in our program. So we run a two year missionary program. Uh -huh. and so we have about seventy missionaries in that, and then we have an additional like fifty or so people on our staff, our missionary staff. So okay. Pretty big uh, uh, thing going on, which is so awesome. it works kind of like net ministries, same idea. Bit, yes. But people yep. commit to to a, a period of time as missionaries. So then the worship ministry, Damascus worship, is part of that. And I understand, Seth, that you were one of the founding people of the worship team. Tell I us was, about that. I was. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the Lord was just really doing a lot with our worship movement. Um, we were, worship was a big part of our retreats, of our summer camps. Um, it was, we were just experiencing a lot mm -hmm. of these kids encounter the Lord powerfully in worship. And that kind of led us into start writing some of our own music. So at first we were just kind of covering other people's things. And we decided like, well, let's start writing a little bit. Let's see what the Holy Spirit wants to speak through us, specifically also for Catholics during this time. Mm -hmm. And so we started to write. And this was back in 2019, really, 2019 into 2020. We kind of started writing. And then you know, when COVID happened and everything kind of shut down, we're like, well, all of a sudden we have a lot of extra time on our hands. <laughs> and why not record an album? So that's when we recorded our first album. Okay. And, and um, it was just really cool then to kind of see how that morphed about. That was again in 2020. And then that kind of started uh, Damascus worship as a, a worship movement, where then we began to see traction with it, see more people interested. And we began to kind of invest more into it and um, really kind of visioneer with the lord what this looks like yeah it's wonderful so abby why why damascus why is it called damascus do you know it's called damascus um really based off of saint paul's encounter with god on the road to damascus that at an, an encounter with damascus um and then saint paul being formed and equipped was able to be sent on a mission to the world so we hope that that happens here and actually we've seen it happen not just yeah. hope that we've over the course of the years that people encounter Jesus and then are sent on to lifelong mission, which is so, it's amazing. Every week I'm like blown away by how many kids like walk on, not knowing the Lord and then walk off knowing That's him. wonderful. Praise okay. God. So, so, I mean, I mentioned some of the things, obviously retreats or conferences uh, that you do official conferences, but is it mostly, are you going into schools or do the students come to your campus? Do you have teams across the country? How does that work? Yeah. So the main, our biggest, we call it our flagship program is our summer camp. So we have about close to 7,000 kids coming oh, wow. to our summer camp every year, which is just wow. insane. And then um, throughout the year, then schools and um, parishes are sending their kids to our campus to run. We have a confirmation retreat, a leadership retreat, a faith and science retreat. We have high school retreats. We do a men's and women's retreat. We do a worship conference, a young adult conference. So most of it is them being sent here, but then also our missionary team will go out into the community and we run a lot of the youth groups throughout the diocese. So we actually get to okay. these kids um, who come on retreat because most of them are coming from Columbus. We have some, you know, in Michigan okay. and Fort Wayne and whatever, but they come and then we get to go help run weekly youth groups with them to help them grow in their faith. Okay. So it's a diocese and mainly in the, in your own diocese, Columbus is the diocese, Currently, the Archdiocese yeah. of Columbus. Um. Let's talk a little bit about the music then, because um, you have a worship team. You guys are part of that group, but there's probably more than just the two of you. How does that work? How many people like does it come in and out? Who's writing the music? I know, Seth, you have your own stuff. I, I'd like to talk to you about that one day, maybe on another program. But uh, so tell us a little bit about how that dynamic works. Who writes the music? How, how much? How big is the team? All yeah. of that. It's super fun. We kind of we call ourselves a collective, yeah. Um, okay, we're really kind of a collective of of people. So right now we have uh, how many of us are there now? Five, six, six, six okay. full time employees within like our our Damascus staff. So we have like six employees, but then also there's a number of like people that aren't like in the worship department, but mm -hmm. they're part of the team, you know. So we like our drummer is currently a student at Franciscan, you know. Okay, but. Like he'll come and do events for us, but we also have two other missionaries that are also drummers. And so sometimes they'll come and do events for us or like things like that. So really there's, there's a large number of people, I would say probably 
between, you know, probably like 15 people wow. that at any given moment we can kind of call on or that are part of, you know, the team. And then we're really all writing. I'm doing a lot of writing. Oh, yeah. A lot of our team is really beginning to step more into that and continuing to write more. Um, so it's really fun just to kind of see um, how that's like forming about uh, and how people are kind of growing in that gift and skill set for the church. So you guys are the, the five of you that are employees. Are you missionaries? Do you also commit as missionaries for, for two years or however long, or are you actually employees? Yeah. So of the, the six of us in there two only one of us was not in the missionary program. So all okay. of us did two year missionary program. And then you get, there's an opportunity to come on what we call our missionary staff, which is kind of like you're, you're, it's like a quasi you're an employee and quasi you're still a missionary. Yeah. yeah okay, so you're I still see. doing a lot of like support raising and raising your salary and, you know, just kind of having a little odd work hour sometimes, but then it's also a little more of a, like a stable actual like position and Damascus becomes like a support partner for you. So there's right. a whole system, but the six of us are all now missionary staff. So we're on staff on the team. So those six of you that are on staff, part of your job i guess like you'd show up to work in the morning and it's like okay let's write some songs like <laughs> let's record yeah. today we're going to record like is that part of your job i'll, I'll talk about my part and you can kind of talk about <laughs> okay it. yeah go for it i get to i'm kind of some of the director so i'm ahead of the team sometimes it is like hey let's write songs <laughs> you know sometimes nice. it is we're recording today or we're having meetings to plan for a recording that's coming up in a couple months you okay. know Other times it's a lot of um like just kind of helping train our missionaries who are leading worship so we can continue to raise that worship leaders mm -hmm. a lot of us we run a worship conference so it's like planning worship for that conference or planning worship for some of the events that we do um or things like that and then abby handles a lot of our booking process yeah it's funny when i like talk to people and i'm like the booking manager but also i might be the worship leader at the event yeah 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 <laughs> so i like do that i love coaching our missionaries we do song right as part of our day um yeah, just kind of like helping with the day-to-day -day operation. Right. We're such a small team. We kind of all do everything. I was going to say, yeah, like in the Catholic Church, yeah. who doesn't wear, you know, <laughs> Many hats. seven different hats? Yeah. It um, keeps it exciting. It keeps it exciting. Yeah, for sure. So this this is going to air over the weekend. So your new album, EP, would have come out the day before, right? On Friday, you're saying it comes out on Friday. So I'm going to talk about it as if it already happened. Great. So your your new album or EP, I should call it, just dropped on Friday. Tell us about that summer. Summer, these summer EP. Summer EP. Yes, summer EP. So it's kind of unique in the sense of um every year at CYC, which is Catholic Youth Summer Camp or Summer Camp, uh -huh. there is a, a theme that we have a site. We have like a six-year cycle uh rotation theme. So what some year it's like a Marian year, some year it's like a Eucharistic year, some years it's like a Holy Spirit year. So it's like there's a Latin phrase and then there's a theme that our talks and our our dramas are kind of like built around. So okay. two summers ago was body and blood was the theme. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was all about the Eucharist. Last year was called death into life. And it was all about the Paschal mystery, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then the coming summer is come Holy Spirit. And it's all about Holy Spirit. So we had three songs written. Um, that each every year for summer camp we kind of write like a theme song for it um, like a song that is used throughout the week to lead campers deeper in worship so right. years ago we wrote a um, it was a modern version of the uh, plunge lingua which is like a mm -hmm. classical church latin thomas aquinas beautiful yes. hymn and it's actually the last two verses of it are the tantum ergo that yep. we see in the adoration so yep. we use a version of that um um, that just came out um, a couple weeks ago. And then we did one called Death into Life. And then we have one coming out or that just came out yesterday called Friend to Me. And um, so those are like the three songs. And that's why it's called Summer EP, because it's like we were like, what is the common thread between these songs? Nothing really, except the fact that all of them are a theme song for our right, summer. For summer. Yeah, so we're going to call it Summer EP, which is funny because initially that was just the work. It, like we didn't have a title for it. And we just kept saying like, Hey, like we got a weird chord yeah. for the summer EP today. We got to do this. And then at some point someone was like, what if we just called it summer EP? And we're like, let's do it. Honestly, let's just, let's just call it. Summer That's EP. funny. Okay. And we're going to actually, we're going to end the program with that song death into life. Uh, so, which is great, great song, by the way. Um, thank you, you guys. It's been super, uh, super cool to be with you today and to learn a little bit about the ministry and, 
I mean, the more music you have, the more opportunities we have to bring you on the program to talk about what you do. And uh, I'm super excited to learn about new ministries. So I'm sure that anybody listening in the, I guess, in the state of Ohio or in the diocese, they probably already know of you. But if they don't, they should go check out Damascus. Um, thank you so, so much. And may God bless you in your ministry. Hey, thank you so much. It was an honor to be with you. Yes, thank you so much. You can learn more about Damascus Worship at their website, damascusworship.com, and about Damascus Catholic Mission Campus at damascus.net. And to listen to this interview again or to hear the rest of the program, go to our website, slmedia.org slash podcast. And here now to take us out is Damascus Worship with Death Into Life from their new summer EP. I was at the edge All my life a mess Trapped inside these prisons That I built up for myself I was two steps from the end Fear was my best friend I was at rock bottom When I gave my cry for help Then from death into life You brought me into life so shame upon you, all the dark went running from the fire. Oh, from death into life, I was saved just in time. There's no grave that you can't empty, there's no corpse you can't revive. All glory to the God of resurrection. Come on! All glory to the one who won the battle for my heart. All glory to the King of all creation. Christ, who brought me from death into life. Listening to the worship team of Damascus Worship with Death into Life from their summer EP. This is a special best of edition of the Salt and Light Hour. I'm Deacon Pedro. Check out our website at slmedia.org slash podcast. Welcome to the Salt and Light Hour Part 2. I'm Deacon Pedro. When Maria J. Bain felt inspired to write a children's book, The Glory of God, and couldn't find the right publisher, after a lot of prayer, she decided to start her own publishing company. JMJ Press was started to publish inspirational works of beautiful art and literature that give glory to God and ignite a passion and desire for holiness. To find out more, earlier this week I spoke with Maria J. Bain. Maria, welcome to the Salt and Light Hour. It's good to meet you. Great to meet you too. Thanks for inviting me. So the book, it seems the book is really the foundation for the publishing company. Tell us a yes. little bit, tell us a little bit more about the book, The Glory of God, in a nutshell. Well, glo- sure. So in a nutshell, what it really does is it teaches children that everyday moments are where they're face to face with God. And that in each moment they have a choice to stay in his company 
or turn away. And when they do decide to turn away, they have the sacrament of reconciliation to bring them back. And so in the book, it shows the Beatitudes, the Ten Commandments. It has mm. a examination of conscience, and it shows them how when they go to confession, it's really Jesus who is forgiving their sins and that they are starting over and that it's like their parents are giving them a brand new piece of paper when they've messed up a drawing. They right. they start over and God doesn't worry about that messed up drawing. He lets them begin again and his mercy is so great and his love is great. And so it really shows children that in everyday moments, they have choices like mom told me to make the bed. Should I do my best at school? Should I share all these different things? And it's and they realize it's really their choice. And when they choose to stay in God's company, they truly are a reflection of God and the glory of God, that children okay. are the glory of God. And would you say, what's what age range is the book for? What age group? Well, I believe it would be a great, uh, and I've been told this too, for First Communion and okay. the Sacrament of First Reconciliation. Okay, yeah. But I sent a copy to every single Catholic elementary school in the United States and also every director of religious education in the United States. Wow. I sent them a copy of this book and it's available in English and Spanish. Yes. But what I'm hearing from them is that it's such a great resource, not only to prepare them for the sacraments, but for their parents and for right. even pre-K all the way through. I'm hearing that it's just such a great lesson and that the illustrations are so beautiful right. and that they're really loving it. Yeah. Usually really good children's books are also very good for the, for the adults. Um, I'm curious about JMJ, those letters. Why did you choose that for the name for the publisher? Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. I write a lot of note cards. I used to work for Catholic TV as their director mm -hmm. of institutional advancement. And I always begin all my letters with the cross and Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And so my middle name is Joseph. It's Maria J. Bain. So I'm named after Our Lady and St. Joseph. And so it's very important for me to incorporate the Holy Family and all that I do, um, but also JMJ Press and the Glory of God is dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Right, my mom. I have to tell you, my mom would always write JMJ at the top of every single letter that she wrote, and she I do too. she wrote letters every day. I would get a letter from her once a week, and there was always JMJ <laughs> there. So, so that's I do that's, that too. That's wonderful, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Um, is it your hope then that you would be mostly publishing children's books? Actually, I, I have a lot of people that have reached out to me to see if I would publish their works. And one in particular is a priest in the United States. Uh, he wrote the most beautiful book on um, the martyrs of the Eucharist. So no, it's not going to be just children's book. I think I'm going to concentrate my writing oh. on children's books. But I will be accepting other authors, and it doesn't have to be children's books. So is this an, a, an appeal right now? We can tell that, that people, <laughs> authors, authors to be wannabes, well, they, can, are you looking for submissions? I actually am going to be looking at in 2024 right now, getting everything up and going, and then also trying to market the glory of God yes. as our first book is keeping me very busy. Um, I have had several people send me things and I'm saying, oh, next year, or next year, I'll look at it. But I couldn't put down Father Sophie's work. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that and the Holy Spirit's inspirations. But my plan is to wait till next year. And of course, we're only a couple months away from that. But we'll right. see what the Holy Spirit will what the Holy Spirit has in mind. And the Holy Spirit always has something in mind that we didn't expect, right? Um, exactly. Would you say that we need Catholic publishers? I mean, Catholic publishers publishing Catholic books that are not just the classics, you know, I mean, Catholic books. Yes. Why? Why? Well, not just Catholic books, but well-written, beautiful Catholic books. Because yeah. I think one of the things that inspired me with JMJ is I had read this prayer that the glory of God, you experience it in all nature and literature and art. And so 
I really love how Bishop Barron always incorporates the beauty of art in Catholicism. Yes. And I feel like that's very important to do because our faith is so beautiful. And that's why with the stories that I uh, publish, I really want that beauty to shine through, not just in the writings, the illustration, uh, the cover page, the art. I want everything to reflect the beauty of Catholicism and the beauty of God. Mm -hmm. What would you say to parents, and and particularly because because I'm thinking of of a children's book and parents that are looking for beautiful uh, stories of truth and goodness and beauty um, for their children. Um, what do you tell that parent that's really struggling with finding the right books? Oh, I'm trying to create them that they'd be able yes. to purchase and share with their kids. So I think that I really love buying children's books. I don't have any grandchildren. I have two grown uh, men, I'd like to say. Yes. Uh, but I'm always, I love books. So I'm always buying books and I'm especially always buying Catholic books. So um, they are out there and um, I'm trying to elevate it and uh, make all the works that we publish really beautiful and faith filled so that not only children will get something out of it, but adults as well. Mm -hmm. um, also, when I worked for Catholic TV, I talked to a lot of our donors and a lot of the elderly people that I had spoken to were afraid to go to confession. They hadn't been in 40 years or something like that. And so in my conversations with all these uh, donors, I was really thinking about them when I created this book as well. And when God gave me this book, because I thought, gosh, if they could read the simple little children's book about the sacrament of reconciliation, it would really calm mm. them and give them the grace to go to confession and not to be afraid that it truly is God. They're waiting for them to unburden their heart and to forgive them and let them start over. I know. And everybody struggles with that, I think that when we come in the presence of God, we're all children, really. So yes. it, it's a wonderful idea to have a children's book that's actually uh, offered to all of us that can that to help us grow closer to God through the sacrament of reconciliation and 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 through the work that you're doing, Maria. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm, uh, thank you. I'm going to say thank you to the Holy Spirit for for inspiring you to to start this new publisher and uh good luck in all that you do we look forward to uh more books from 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 you and from the publisher thank you god um, bless you yes you too thank you that was a conversation from earlier this week maria j bain is the founder and president of jmj press you can learn more at jmjpress.org and here now is our featured artist of the week, PJ Anderson, with his new single, Heart Healer. You have known my heart before it was my own. You're not afraid of all I've done. You tell me who I am. If I could see all the ways that you see me, one by one my fears would leave until I'm in your arms. You draw a line in the sand, you tell me who I am, Jesus, Jesus. Your eyes are on my heart Jesus, Jesus Your love is never far You have been A light that shines when life grows dim I can't defeat my sin You show me that I can You draw a line in the sand You tell me who I am Jesus, Jesus Your eyes are on my heart Jesus, Jesus Your Far. Oh, 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 oh. From broken 
Defender, you have always been heart healer. From broken to mended, you will always be my heart healer. My constant defender, you will always be my heart healer. That was PJ Anderson with his new single, Heart Healer, and singing with PJ on that track is Sarah Kroger. We last spoke with PJ Anderson in March 2019 when he released his last album, Light and Dark. But we had met PJ after World Youth Day Krakow in 2016. For a few years now, PJ has been leading worship once a month for an event in Nashville called Summit. He also has been writing, recording, and releasing singles that will end up as an album titled Heart Healer. And so to tell us more, I am now joined by PJ Anderson from his home in Nashville. PJ, it's good to see you. Welcome back to the program. Yeah, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. So what have the last couple of years been like for you guys? Uh, I mean, I became a homeschool teacher for... (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, and uh, and it was it was actually really great. It was difficult at times, but it was great. Yeah, it was a great, yeah. You, most people, yeah. Was it great for you? Was it great for your kids too? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. Think so. I think it was. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, I, I think they learned. They did learn a lot. I didn't think I could be a teacher, but I did it, and I think they did learn a lot. Um, and and then I uh, just was writing a ton and wasn't traveling much, so I just didn't. You know, I was before that I was on the road a ton. Yeah. And it's starting to, it's finally back, back. Um, and so back out playing, playing music with uh, solo stuff and with my band and and putting out new songs as well. feels really great. Do you, do you, did you miss the traveling and the, the touring or did you find that COVID was a good opportunity to kind of reset and maybe re not redefine, well, but sort of rethink yeah. your, your ministry? Definitely both, both and yeah. um, really great. I mean, I definitely, realized that I hadn't really been home much on Saturdays in like 10 years, yeah. you know? And I mean, obviously I was home on some Saturdays. I wasn't gone and booked all the time, right. but um, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. There's, there's uh, I was gone a lot. And so it was a, a good reset. We were lucky that, you know, we were all safe and, and mm-hmm. healthy, but um, it was a good reset, but I also miss, miss traveling and, and you can only do those online. Uh, oh, worship thing that was like the worst it was, you can only <laughs> no, do so many i could only do a few of those i could yeah. some people no. really excelled at those and i was just no. like i can't i really like count on interacting with yeah people. of course you know enneagram oh. seven and like enfp like extreme extrovert so it was, it was <laughs> tough doing those concerts but it was a good reset but it's also reminded me too like I'm, i love what i get to do and um and i feel like it is a calling um, yeah Oh, and then there's those times, there's those darker times where the, you know, the accuser that is, is putting in your head, like, you're not, you're nobody wants to hear from you again. Like, it doesn't matter if you go ever go back out. And then I go back out and it's like, if it's like, oh yeah, yeah. That's God made me to do this. Yeah, I, of course. I enjoy it and I love it. And, um, it's good to be back. Yeah. Did you find that it was also a fruitful time? Like a lot of the songs that are coming out now, did, did, did they come out of that period of time? Yeah, some of some of them did. Some of them I'd written like right before. Yeah. Um, some afterwards, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, definitely lots of time to reflect uh, and and lots of new experiences during that that time. So I was looking at your website, of course, getting ready for this, and I I read something that I don't think I had picked up from you before, that you're at home writing worship music for the church. Um, and not to not to say that I didn't think that your music was your typical worship music, but it isn't. Can, can, what do you mean by that? Um, I mean my my first experience being playing guitar was I probably said this on the show before, uh, learning from a nun and then playing in yeah. school masses and yeah. then playing in the worship band uh, at my church. Actually, before that, I think I started playing in like you know Grateful Dead, Fish, <laughs> rock cover bands. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. In bars and in college, and then started coming back to the, the yeah. 
and at my church when I'd be home uh, summers and after college. And, um, and I don't know, I mean, I, I was in a band that we, it was pop Americana and, and life and love songs and heartbreak. And, you know, sometimes a little too depressing, yeah. but sometimes, sometimes not just life and love. And, um, I don't know. I feel like a lot of times the songs I was writing is like kind of pop songs were more like of heartbreak and mm -hmm. I feel really blessed to have the most amazing wife and, and kids. And so I find, I don't, I want to, I want to also get to that space of writing, you know, uplifting love songs as well. But I think it's more, I've just found that home writing songs uh, for the Lord and songs that, that um, help me pray. Cause I think that's a, that's a, yeah place I need to work on, you know, praying. And I feel like I pray the best when I sing. And so hopefully I can write songs that can help me pray. And then in turn, hopefully other people can pray with them as well. And that's, that's what I see. That's what I mean when I, I count on that engaging with the yeah. crowd and with the congregation and with people. Um, I just posted something the other day about, or today about um, my, one of my favorite things to do is sing uh, and lead worship, but also step back from the mic and hear, yeah. oh, yes. hear Debbie pray. You know, yeah. that's that's yeah. so beautiful. And and writing songs, I think it's it's a really cool thing. I mean, I've I've I'm friends with some people, some songwriters who have songs and hymnals at, at, in Catholic churches all over. And I think that's a that's a pretty cool. Um, I don't know if legacy is the right word, but just a, a cool yeah. mark to leave on the world, like a song that that might yes. be for hundreds of years after I'm gone. Um, absolutely pray with so. absolutely yeah and I, I i i was gonna say that that you're not just creating music that helps you pray but you're helping others pray which is which is i guess what it's all of it's it's all about um, yeah and why you would have uh you know like that monthly worship mm. evening summit that you yes. that you that you started with your wife with rachel well, it's funny you say that. Oh, we didn't actually start it. It was started before we moved to Nashville. Oh, okay. Soon, it was called something else, and then okay. um, we were. I was asked to be part of the band, and and then kind of came clear like we need you to kind of take this over, and and so <laughs> we, we started. Uh, my wife is like a marketing whiz, so it helped with marketing and with um, right. I mean small things, nothing big, but just yeah. getting the word out and spreading the word, and then. Um, I was in charge of music and the band and and we we kind of rebranded it, changed the name to Summit, started doing this this night. Um, it's like a worship night in the round. So the band's mm -hmm. the center and then everyone sits around us or stands around us. Okay. And, and we all sing. So it's like you're all part of the band. You're, yeah, you're I love together it. Together singing and worshiping. And we have some music, um, you know, 30, 40 minutes of, of, of music. When, when we did that in the round thing, it really changed the engagement. Like people yeah, I can imagine we were up on a stage before it was like, this is a concert. We're going to listen. And that's not, wasn't the point. It was, let's do this together. So really changed the engagement and excelled that. And then um, after music, a little talk, and then we have um, adoration and reconciliation with sometimes with music, with the whole band. Sometimes we do it in the same room. Sometimes we go to a church, uh, but oh, it, wonderful. Yeah. COVID and tornadoes kind of knocked it out for a little bit. And we finally, People were asking, it was on my heart too. I missed it. And we brought it back just recently. Okay. So it's monthly. So if anybody's in Nashville once a month, yeah. uh, once a month, it's, it's on a Wednesday. Usually okay. I think it's, we try to do the last Wednesday of the month uh, pretty much because there's Nashville is pretty, uh, pretty amazing Catholic population and yes. lots of events going on. So we were like, all right, theology on tap is on this day. So we can't do it. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Yeah. This meeting on this day. We can't do it then. And young Catholic professionals meeting here. We can't do it yeah. then. Yes, yeah. went for this Wednesday, last Wednesday of the month, usually. Yeah, and we okay. have guest musicians come in. Um, oh, okay, each month and guest speakers, and so the musicians come join the band and speakers speak. Okay, I'll have to make sure next time I'm in Nashville to time it so that it's the last week. Yeah, that'd yeah, be fun. Amazing. Um, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to have you. So the the songs that you've been that we've been listening to in the program so far, there. Your hope is that you're going to compile them into an album. Um, mm -hmm. But the title track, correct me if I'm wrong. So Heart Healer with, that we just heard would be kind of, did, did you get the sense that the whole album, like, why is that? I'm always intrigued as to why a song ends up being a title track. Yeah. 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 We went back and forth with it. And and one other song, You and You Alone, uh, felt like yeah. a good, well, because it's it kind of embodies the, the songs as well. But Heart Healer was just a, I love that phrase for for the Lord. Yeah, 
someone who comes in and, and can heal every wound and every disbelief and every doubt and every struggle. Um, and, and it's, you know, I wrote it with, with, uh, good friend, Sarah Kroger and her husband, yeah. Dom Qualia and, and, um, yeah. Andrew Laubacher as well, another Catholic musician. And we, we, we base it on that, that, that gospel of Jesus drawing the line in the sand uh, in front of the woman who's about to be stoned. And, yeah. and he just comes in and protects her and saves her. And it, I played this, I just played this in, um, uh, Portugal at World Youth Day. Uh -huh. and, uh, I'll try to, I'll try to make a long story short, but it was, I mean, it, you, that's where we met. That's where I met you was at World Youth Day. Yeah. In Krakow. Yeah. And um, I got slotted to play. I found out two days before that the, the stage I was playing with, they're like, we need you there really early because the Pope's going to be there. Yeah. I was like, uh, I don't really get nervous, but you know, all four of my kids, <laughs> see all these pictures in the background right there, my, all four of my kids getting kissed by the Pope. They've met him, but I haven't. And yeah. so like, all right, I'm a little nervous. And there's literally 800,000 people there. Yes. Yes. Um, and so my mom, my parents were there, my wife was there, my kids and uh, my wife's parents as well. And, and my mom calls over this. She's like, PJ, come here. There's this Franciscan friar. He's an Irish um, Capuchin, like Padre Pio's. Um, another thing I'm looking at, pray, hope and don't worry. He's up in our house. Like yeah. favorite, one of my favorite saints, one of his friars is there. He's, he's from Dublin. And she's like, he's going to, wants to pray for you before you go out. And I was like, that's, that's really what I need right now. And I go, um, I'm like, can I bug you? for confession. Cause I've been trying to find a priest all day and you'd think at world youth day, it'd be easier. But I popped into like multiple churches. I just couldn't find an English speaking priest. Yeah. Like it's not bog but bothering me at all. Like it's, that's my job. And he, he said words to me that I, mean, I confessed and he said, um, you know, everything you just confessed all 12 of the apostles struggled with. And I was like, Phew. and he said this, this one, God and Jesus is more concerned is, is not concerned with who you were. It's, it's who you are with him. Yeah. That gave me all the peace and all the confidence to walk out there and, and sing and, and, and really just, just pray, like just pray through it. Another friend had recommended oh, that. To wow. he, he'd been in that slot before. He's like, just go out there and do what you do and pray yeah. through it. And have fun, you know? And so, but that heart healer, that's, that's what I felt at that confession, that, my heart being healed by the yeah. yeah. So that, that just felt like a, it's, it's a, I think it's a beautiful name for God. It is a beautiful name for God. And uh, can I just say, so I heard your sound check. <laughs> oh, no way. Oh yes. And I didn't know. I was like, Hey, I know that voice. Of course, <laughs> like you're impossible to not recognize your voice. Um, but I couldn't stay because we were delivering programs and stuff. So of course I saw it on, you know, I ended up watching the the paper welcome on TV, but yeah, crazy. Anyway, yeah, that's, that's awesome. it was crazy. Yeah, it was a good time. World Youth Day. Anyway, yeah. PJ, um, it's good to connect with you. Thank you. I'm so glad that there's there's music, and I'm I'm looking forward to when the album comes out in the new year, so we can uh, listen to the whole thing. I like to listen to albums together. You yeah. know, it's like it's an album yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you for sharing with us uh, what you do, a little bit about what you do today. Yeah. And maybe I'll see you in Nashville on uh, Wednesday and at Come some on. point. Come on down. All right. Take care, man. God bless. You, you can learn more about PJ Anderson at his website, pjandersonmusic.com. And if you missed any part of this interview, head on over to our site, slmedia.org slash podcast, because all our programs are archived there here now to take us out is pj anderson with his new single good god i
we're listening to PJ Anderson with his single, Good God. And that concludes this special edition of the Salt and Light Hour. Remember to visit our website, sllmedia.org. That's where you can listen to all our programs, and not just podcasts. There's a lot of content there, videos and, and our blog. And also, that's where you can watch Salt and Light Television. And that's also where you can find out everything you want about Salt and Light Media and how you can support our ministry, slmedia.org. If you have any questions or comments or just to say hello, email me, pedro at slmedia.org. I love your emails and also your comments. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, or X. Thank you for being with us today for this special edition of the Salt and Light Hour. I'm Deacon Pedro. <laughs>